That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. That Great Business Show.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 87 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 13th of May, 2022. I am your host, Conal O'Moran. Coming up on your favorite business podcast, we bring you a national treasure, or maybe more correctly, the custodian of the national treasure, that is Clonakilty Black Pudding. We might also get around to talking about the tsunami that wrecked a thriving linen business in that Cork town. Yes, you heard me right, a tsunami. This is That Great Business Show, after all, where we do business differently. We're also taking care of business for you by telling you how you can really cut down on those spiraling business energy bills whilst also doing your thing for the environment. We're still getting some great feedback for the candid interview given by the newish Enterprise Ireland boss, Leo Clancy, who joined us for episode 82. Do have a listen to it over the weekend. You'll learn what businesses EI are focusing on an insight that may prove useful to your business. This and all the other great business insights and tips are brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. De Facto Shaving Oil, smooth as... Now, like the majority of our listeners that we like to refer to as Team GBS, I got all of my schooling in this country, and I was a very, very long time out of school, when I first heard about a tsunami that hit Ireland in 1755, what effect it had was to literally overnight shut down a thriving flax and linen industry that had grown up in the beautiful West Cork town of Clonakilty. And I've had a bit of a fascination with Clon, as it's known since then, and I have been very keen for some time to have another force of nature from there, the CEO of the iconic brand that is Clonakilty Black Pudding, Colette Toomey, on the podcast. As well as running the family business since 1977, Colette has been mayor of Clonakilty, a mentor on the Enterprise Ireland Back to Going for Growth program, and more recently she has bought a beautiful estate with its own golf course, and she is now developing a golf club, as you do. Colette Toomey. Welcome to That Thank Great you. Business Show. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted busy, to be here. I'm not busy enough without trying to develop a golf club. <laughs> well, the golf club is was in is is there. It was in existence, a nine-hole golf club, but um, we're developing it into um, a full 18-hole course. And did you just tell me you don't even play golf? Well, I do. I do. Not as much as I'd like to, but um, yeah, I just um, very, very, basically, I'm very, um, I have the highest handicap since I first took a golf club in my in my hand. So I don't uh, go into the competitions, but I enjoy a walk around. Well, when people see what you're developing, I hadn't seen it until I was just researching what uh, all about you. It is beautiful. It's, it's divine. It's a lovely spot. And it's a, it's a well-kept secret, really, because um, it, I suppose I'm the, the first Irish person to own that estate, um, uh, really, and um, it, it was always very much um, maybe behind um, there's the big high gates and walls. So um, it's great, and it's um, our plans. We haven't. We have. We have lots of ideas, lots but, of ideas, but nothing other than the golf course now for the moment. But you've got also beautiful. Is it twenty acres of of, uh, of gardens? The gardens, yeah. The gardens are are, are gardens are beautiful, and um, they were at one stage open to the public. Um, they probably will be again, but um, just at the moment now we're um, we're concentrating on the golf club. And we'll get into business in a second. So, how quickly or how soon will we see the golf club open? Um, we're waiting for planning permission, and how long is a piece of string? Mm. Um, planning permission, but we're we we are up to fourteen. Just just next month to open the fourteenth hole. We're doing it bit by bit, one by one. Um, it's um, so we have four. That are in the on the desks in the county council office. So um, hopefully the work will be done next year for opening in twenty twenty four. Fantastic! Just it's a great story. As is the Clonakilty Black Pudding story, founded in nineteen seventy seven by yourself and your late husband Edward, mm -hmm. and the uh, 
I'm not going to ask you about the, the magic formula because everybody asks Nobody. you about that and you're never going to tell me. <laughs> no. And I love the backstory. For anybody who hasn't heard it, it's a secret. It's a secret. It is, <laughs> it is a very, very well kept secret. Yeah, I... But what I am going to ask you is because, well, first of all, let's talk about yourself. You were trained as something that I had never heard of before, a brain technician is what you called yourself. Yes, yes. I could have used oh, one of those when yep. I was a kid. <laughs> the other, um, um, you know, the same as you have an ECG for your heart, you have an EEG for your brain. And I started when I um, did my leaving start and um, after leaving start and I went um, in, to St. Finbar's Hospital at the time um, for the start of a four-year course and did two years um, the next two years were were supposed to be in Great Ormond Street in London. But um, lo and behold, the heart ruled the head and I got married down in Clonacilty instead. You got a phone call from your late husband asking you whether you would like to be the wife of a butcher. <laughs> butcher. In- even though he wasn't a butcher. <laughs> well, he had bought the butcher shop um, just the year before. From and his uh, From his uncle. From his uncle, yeah. The, the butcher shop that we have in, in Pierce Street. And... Um, yeah, that was that was kind of the gist of the proposal. How would you like to be a butcher's butcher's wife in Clonakilty in West Cork? Now you are the mammy of three grown-up men. <laughs> How can you give any career advice to anybody? Since you went off no. to be a brain technician, <laughs> you became no. a butcher, and now you are—I won't call you an industrialist because I think you avoid the whole idea that you have a factory. But you have a thriving food business. Um, I suppose the advice, I, I, I'm not one to tell anybody what they should or shouldn't do with their career, but I would say uh, follow your gut. Follow your gut. And You're I, a that's big probably, person on the I gut, aren't prob- you? That, yeah. I was probably, that's the way I was at the time and, you know, I didn't go wrong. Because there's a term that you used as well somewhere I was listening to you. Opportunity and instinct is not what uh, makes you look, yes. according to you. Yes, um, yes, that, that's my definition. And, and I, I don't know where I heard it, but um, that everybody's saying, but weren't you so lucky? You know, you're lucky. And everybody's, anybody, people who are succeeding are deemed to be lucky. And um, I heard this, that luck is a combination of opportunity and instinct, your gut. So if your gut tells you the opportunity is right, you go for it. And that's your luck. And another way that you have and that you continue to have, as I understand it, of growing your business is to listen. You continue to listen to anybody who comes into your shop, your factory, or who has a chat with you. Yes. And that has determined the growth uh, of, it, the, of, the, of the company. It has, um, yes, because everybody, you know, there is so much um, information out there. There is so much um, good advice. There is some bad advice and that's where your instinct and your gut tells you um, you don't take everybody's advice on board but you do listen and you do make your own of it and it's you know instinctively it's if it's right for you or if it's not Inclu- you, you know the feel the feel in- is there including the tea lady in Dunn Stores yes yes oh, that's going back a long time that's do tell back. the story um yeah, my our, our um, sales manager Cal McCarthy was with me at a Dunn Stores meeting, and there, you know, Dunn Stores, you go to the head office and you meet the buyer and you meet all of this, and they're all you negotiate for the year and all this kind of stuff. And um, we were waiting when we went into the room. The buyer said to the lady who was just gathering up the um, the cups and saucers from the last people in. Um, said, these people have come, is there a cup of tea going for these people? They've come all the way from Clonacilty. And she turned around, she said, oh, is that the Clonacilty sausages and Clonacilty pudding? And um, and we said, yes, that's 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 us. And um, she was going about her business and she said, do you know what you badly want? You badly want a gluten-free. My sister and my daughter are gluten-free and you're really, they, they used to love sausages and now they can't have them. You really do need to have a gluten-free sausage. And we said, oh, yeah, we're working on it, working on it. And that was the end of the conversation. We were working on in, in it was in the idea pool, not not working on it, really. And um, but a week later, the buyer said, um, Margaret Heffernan wants to know um, where we are with the gluten free sausage. When are we likely to have them? Because we, Dunn stores wanted to be 
They, first. They, want to, they wanted to be first. The tea lady um, went back upstairs to Margaret Heffernan and said, oh, the Clonakilty people are downstairs and they're going to have a gluten-free sausage. And uh, so we were chased, barking at the heels, and we were um, chased. And um, yeah, we did We did um, work on it and we were very anxious that we would have a sausage that was tasted as near as down the to our everyday sausage. And um, yeah, that was... And we had the gluten-free black and white pudding as well then. So they're going well. The packaging on the gluten-free, unfortunately, is exactly the same as the non-gluten-free because I often pick up the wrong oh, package. Oh, well, we've actually lately, um, in the last 12 months, changed our packaging. And I think it is clearer on it. It is a wee bit is, clearer, yeah. Yeah, a wee bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, let's go all the way back. There was, if there is, a butcher shop on Pier Street in Clannacilty. Yes, and that yes. is where the whole story began because people came and continued to come in saying that they loved your black pudding, the famous secret black pudding. Mm-hmm. Unlike, because again, I, having listened to many of your interviews, you know that many, many, many butchers around the country were making their own black pudding. But you went, and when I say you, you and Edward went and you expanded it, you pushed it when others didn't. Isn't that it, Yes, and I suppose, you know, um, every butcher, there was a time when um, Edward wanted to give up the pudding because he wanted to expand the shop and he there was the back room and um, there was valuable um, space and he wanted to extend the shop into it and did think seriously about it. But public opinion was different. The people came in for the pudding and decided, we decided, okay, that's it. The pudding is staying. So then how do you grow on that? And the, the, the reason he wanted to give it up, because it was very troublesome inside in the back of the shop and you, you know, you mix the pudding and you fill it into the casing and you boil it. And, you know, it was a long, it was a, a very um, a manual kind of a process. And um, so, he had the idea, well, if it's difficult for us, it's difficult for other butchers. And we actually supplied um, other butcher shop with our pudding without any label on it and guys sold it as their own. Very, and, very entrepreneurial yeah. of you. Now, who claims the credit for that? That was Edward's one. That was clever. That was Edward's one, definitely. It is what we would now call white labelling. It is, it is, it yeah. is yes. And, um, and then... Um, we decided, you know, for to sell it into other, um, that was the butcher shop. So they laid claim to have it as their own. But in um, the supermarkets were just starting out. But in and This is very interesting about the supermarkets. For listeners now, they won't actually understand what yes. Ireland was like back then. But yeah. Because you gave on one of the interviews a kind of a history lesson of the supermarkets and how they emerged. How they emerged. Yeah, yeah because, because every every shop was, was privately owned and everybody... Um, and I think, you know, um, I remember there was a lot of, our local shop was VG. VG, there was VG shops all over the, you know, and um, um, they they became Musgrave, Musgrave's, Musgrave's own super value. And um, that's how, um, I suppose, it was just a group scheme of um, giving people power to buy. You had the corner shop. You had and and was you, ADM. You, do you remember them? Yes, ADM, yes, yes, yes. Of course, Allied yeah. distributors or something like that. Is yeah, that, that stands for. And they, um, yeah. So they all, um, yeah. So they, it was like a, a group buying scheme for them. And then they were so then they changed the name over the door from being McCarthy's or Murphy's or whatever to being, you know, VG and then um, Mace and then all the all the rest just followed on and so. The, the, that's how it developed, and we had a van on the road. We our, our first vehicle was actually a jeep into the back of the jeep, and and you go. drove the jeep. Oh yeah, oh no problem. Yeah, you yeah. delivered. Yeah. Oh yeah. You grafted. it. <laughs> we did the. Um, no, no, I, I'm not saying yeah. we. I'm saying you. Yes. You actually worked very, very hard. Yes, and I remember the um, my sons um, Edward and Patrick were there at the time, and they were very young. And um, it was a case of just hop in the back and away you went. And, um, and how everything far would was, you distribute? Well, um, I remember when we had um, when we had kind of got, a, um, you know, when we had a, a kind of a routine, one of the routes was um, West Cork 
West Cork from and it went we went down to Bantry but we did Skull and Belly Day Hop and um, Baltimore to put it on the boat to go out to Shirkin um, we used to meet the Hooligans bread van and maybe in in Skibbereen and we either took the bread to the boat in Baltimore or he took the pudding and that's how we did it. and uh, all the ways around down to Bantry we had another I for you know, people to understand yeah. the roads yeah. that is an Awful lot of driving. It's an awful lot of driving. It's an awful lot of driving. And um, even nowadays, when I see the calls that the vans, we, we still have two vans in out of Cork and we have one in Dublin. And I see like they, they, it's nothing like the number of calls because remember every creamery shop along the way and they were all in rural, rural um, crossroads. And um, um, I remember we had... Um, it was numbers of calls and you knew the people personally and you knew their actually we have um there was there was a marriage out of one of the um out, out of one of the um the calls we used to i had um i had a, a, a young guy with me paddy Conlon, and he was 16 and i was driving because he couldn't drive and then uh, he yeah he was 16 and he used to do the running in and out and run I would go in get the sale he'd go out to the out to the van and get the um, fill the order and um, bring it in so um, we we did all of West Cork and different about maybe two days a week and then um, he um, learned to drive and then he was driving and I was I was sitting as his co-driver for a while and we was called to um, a house out in West Cork and little post office and there was the um the mother ran the the grandmother I think ran the shop the mother was helping and the there were girls coming in from school and all of that so um Paddy anyway um caught up with Nora um Noreen um after school at some time and a romance began and that was we actually we used to actually go in and have a cup of tea in that house you know when you're in the middle of your of your run and that from what you were saying earlier that's the opportunity part of the opportunity and instinct it is it is opportunity (laughs) and instinct yeah now you I mean there you go you had kids Uh, Edward is working uh, making the pud and all and butchering as well you're grafting as I keep saying when did the big breakthrough come? Um, one of the big, big um, breakthroughs, you know, we, um, I suppose we didn't ever, there was always vision, but there wasn't ever, um, you know, growth plans and all of the business plans. and you all never wrote it down, things. you mean? We never wrote it down. It was always, yeah, because I remember one time, um, the, was it the banks or somebody were looking for some business plan? And um, Eddie said to me, he said, oh, just write down something. And I remember having a blank bit of paper and he said, you're the one who went to school. Surely you can write something. And uh, because he had left school at um, 14 years of age. And uh, so we had a a vision. And I remember at the time, that that time he said, look, just write down that we love the pudding so much. We would love if everybody could buy it in their local shop. Now, that was not a plan, you know, whether it was a shop in Donegal or in Galway or wherever. But what you said, because again, going back to bits that I picked up, a business plan doesn't record passion. No. It's not a lovely expression. Yes. Because you're then right. Yes. Like people who are in business, who love their business, are nuts about their business mm. and, you know, comes out the pores. Yep, absolutely. And passion alone is no use without hard work. And you were good at that part. Yeah, the the the, the passion. Um, you know, you could you could battle passion. Um, and people are very passionate about things, but if they're not prepared to knuckle down, it's not worth anything. Come on, be a grumpy person for a second. Do you think that uh, next generation work hard? Next generation, they, they probably work smarter. Hmm. They'll work smarter. Um, they will have a better work life balance. Their, their life outside work will be as important. Um, will they grow businesses like yours? Will they grow? Um, they will, but I think a lot of it will be um, scaled and financial decisions and all of that. Um, you won't have the organic and snail pay, well, we call it snail pace growth, but it, it probably is because when you look back, it's happened over so many years. Now, um, they when they're doing plans, they have to have 
grows in six months or 12 months or two years. And if they haven't, oh, throw your hat, it's deemed a failure. You know, it's they, they, they set the bar too high. And um, I, 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 I could do the organic growth, but I couldn't do the uh, and accelerated growth. the organic growth. growth also came from the diaspora from Cork who wanted their pud if they were in Sligo or okay. if they were in Galway That's or if it. they were in Donegal. Or if they had been in Clonakilty for their holidays. Uh, and you literally that, shipped it out to them? We did, we did. We by did. in boxes? And Yeah, by the box. And if you um, needed to take pudding to um, some function in, or function, I'll say, a, a, an agricultural show in Tipperary and um, you put it in the boot of the car and you went off to Tipperary and you didn't c- count the cost per mile or the cost per this or the cost per that. So you you just did it and um, it wasn't always um, economic, it didn't always make economic sense, but it made, um, it, 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 built, it was the blocks of, of um, foundation of success. And I'm going to come back to you on that. I'm going to take a quick break and then we'll go and we'll have a chat about the diaspora in the UK and in Australia, for example. This is Colette Toomey, who is CEO of Clonakilty Sausages, and we'll be back to you in a second. Make one small switch. Switching from shaving foam to all-natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest, softest shave ever. Switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non-recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year. Switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin, your pocket and your planet. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Rate and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. And I'm here with Colette Toomey, CEO of, I called you Clonakilty Sausages. You're actually Clonakilty Black Pudding, isn't that? Clonakilty Black Pudding, Clonakilty Sausages. So Clonakilty Food Company will cover the lot. One of the things that you do, which I thought was so clever when I read into it, is you found, I don't know how you found a butcher in Melbourne, Australia... Yes. Who's got a fabulous name, Mr. It looks like Butcher. It's Bouchier. Or Bouchier, Bouchier. Bouchier, yes. He it, had to be a butcher, didn't he? And he is a butcher. He is. Where did you find him? We found him. We had um, a girl, Karen O'Don- O'Donovan, who was, um, she was working with us, middle 20s, decided to go off to Australia. She was a really good girl. She was, she's, she's too, you know, she was um, really... Um, passionate about our business and she was going off to Australia and I ha- you know happy for her and I was say major loss but to us but um, so anyway Karen went off and I said you know for your first month out there now I'll um, keep you on the payroll um, to do a bit of research for us you know just to see what's out there what's you know opportunity all of that. and instinct yes again. yes <laughs> yes yes um, so um yeah, so anyway, so then Karen came back and she said, well, actually, she, she did a month and we, you know, what what was there, what what was available out there was no great shakes. Of, for Irish people, it was a very, very poor um, alternative for um, for the, the pudding um, back home. And um, so then she actually got a, a project um, uh, from Borbia to um, research other companies. So she was doing um, a fellowship with um, Board B, for Board B and we were one of the companies. And they so they did a bit, they did some of the research. Now, if we had done, when we starting out in, in 76 and 77, there was no research. Like the, you know, now if they're doing something, they check the size of the market and the potential and the opportunity, all this. But um, then... So that was it in Australia, and it but how did like she find Mr. Bouchier? She because how did she find him? Because we uh, we we sent her. I sent her with um, as well. So I won't say instructions, but guidance as to say instructions. Uh, instructions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, because um, 
Yes, to find somebody like us, to find a small producer, find a big producer, you know, the different options. So there was a team of us, um, my son um, Ed and our um, production guy at the time and um, another um, guy who did the, the the white pudding and the sausage development with us way back and we headed off to Australia and we had a, a week of meeting the different options and the different. So I had... Now, when um, are we talking about now? What mm, year? What roughly? Year? roughly? Ooh, um, it was... Um, 80s? 90s. No, no, ninety two. After it was, it was after it was after um, Eddie passed away, so it was after two thousand and five, maybe about two thousand seven or eight. Okay, two thousand and eight or nine, and uh, so um, yeah, we went out there, and everybody had a different point of view, and everybody had a different um, thinking of things, and again, I went for the personality, I went for the fit, I went for. Who would we understand? Um, um, actually, it was the time that there was um, horse meat substitution came up here in Ireland. And that was one of the worries we had that it being something being made remotely as far away as that, you know, of how could you how could you manage or how could you keep um, your your. So we had to go with trust and we had to go with um, and. Um, yeah, I had a small bit of a battle with um, with my with my team at the time because everybody had different views as to who we should go with, and um, yeah, somehow I won out anyway. And, and you were uh, right. Uh, yes, because I can pick up the phone. I'm going to bed at eleven o'clock at night. I'll pick up the phone and I'll ring Peter. How's it going and all? You know, it's he's starting his morning's work. Peter and being down be, in, in, Melbourne. in Melbourne. In Melbourne. Why did we choose Melbourne? Melbourne is more foodie. They're more Irish in Sydney, but um, Melbourne is, is well, there was more potential for development in Melbourne. And then the clever thing that you did was you do not ship out your product. You ship out the S- mix. The spice. You mix the, the the spice. You know you have to make it with Australian meat and all the rest. And um, yeah, so that's we mix. I, I mix the spice at home, and um, it's it's shipped out. No problem with customs or anything like that. You would have a problem with um, um, doing the the meat products. So that's what we do. And we the the first day we met um, Peter and and his team. He said, "Oh, here five, five petty, five petties coming in the door with their cock and bull story about making black pudding and selling it and all this." And um, anyway, I won't say. Well, he's he's a, a very likable character, but he has he has a smile for everything. So we were weren't sure if he was laughing with us or laughing at us. And we he, um, so we left and we. Um, said we would be back in in a few days and when we came back in a few days he had obviously a small bit of research done and he said oh yes yeah, so we see you do make it in Ireland and you do make it like kind of all over Ireland and um, so that's he took us a bit more seriously and um, It's been a fabulous success mm, It is My it is, lovely it little is. daughter Afrik who's a Brisbane based is a, a big consumer, so she's happy with that. Very good, very yeah. good. And um, um, we have um, a girl there, Cindy, at the at the moment, and uh, she is very busy. She's very good at um, you know the development and hampers for Patrick's Day and hampers for Christmas. And you know we're doing the sausages there now. They're not mainstream yet, but they're only in very locally because of shelf life. But um, yeah, we're working on that. But you're all not shipping them. You're, no, you're, no, you're, we're making those out there. Um, um, now, well. into the UK, where you also have a fabulous presence, is th- that is the shipped from Clonakilty. Shipped, shipped from Clonakilty, and uh, you've also broken into the multiples there. Yes, yes, we we have, and we um, some of our product um, about half our, our um, sale goes to OK and Fine Foods, which is um, Eddie OK um, is Irish and is he distributes Irish Irish foods, and then we're into the. Um, the, the supermarkets ourselves and uh, Don is our guy on the ground over there and and I was on your website and I loved the little if you <laughs> if you zero in on an area all the little flags I mean there you oh, are yes. you are almost everywhere except you're not in the states no why not um, again um, the 
um, shipping of meat products. But could you not do a similar thing to... We could, we could, and we're researching that. But now that we have our um, manufacturing facility in Ireland, we are trying to, uh, first of all, to make it in Ireland. And um, But it's proving difficult. But the, the plan B would be to um, contract manufacture over there. Um, would, the Aust- would the Americans be as... Um, Easy. To, now, once easy to manage is not the right way of putting it, but you know, would you have as good a relationship with them as the Australian? I don't know. If you find the right person, if you find the right person, yeah. if you find the right person, but there is huge potential. Now, the um, generation gap is a little bit more in America. Um, the people who are in Australia are hot off the hot off the plane. Uh, there are many familiar. hot off the plane, in maybe they shouldn't be there, including somebody very close to me. Uh, <laughs> they, they are, they are and they're, they're all gumming for yeah. your kind yes. of guilty black pudding. Yes, I know, and that's yeah, and um, and yeah, we we have one of these Borbia fellows, as we call them. They're not fellow f- fellows, but they're they're fellows. Um, and Jennifer, I was there at the. Um, at the moment, um, looking at doing doing the same as Karen did, in, in so we're 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 working on it. Good, that's yeah. good to hear. Yeah, because you also mentioned your new ish plant. New ish. <laughs> well, it's what is it? Four years old. It is. Yeah, four years yeah. old. Yeah, um, and growing all of the time. How many people well, do you now employ? Um, sixty. 60 between, Happens. yeah. And um, yeah, so we have loads of space now and we have um, what was a jam to the rafters um, production facility is now um, easy peasy. You know, we would, um, it's it's um, it's just so different and it's just, well, standards, everything and computerized, everything is, is has um, upgraded. And um, so we have huge room for development as well. Oh, and goody, goody. You're yeah, going to tell me about new much. products coming. No new what products. Are? Well, well, you know, I suppose besides where like meat is getting more and more taboo. And um, well, no, there's a big growth in the um, the veggie, the, the veggie market. And again, then, um, you know, we have our, our, our veggie pudding. Um, there's loads of potential for, we have a veggie spread ready to, um, ready to bring out. We have um, veggie sausages coming down the line, um, but it's it's a, it's a very difficult actually because when you have meat, you have quality. If you have a bit of fat in it, you have flavour. You have all the natural things. It's much more difficult to make it up in in um, in vegetable products, you know. And um, um, so that's where we're where we're working on that. So we're back in bloom now in the June weekend. So we will have a few introduce a few. Bits and pieces there. Oh, very good. That's mm-hmm. interesting. We will have We'd to keep an eye on delighted that. Delighted to be back out again after <laughs> oh, all this time. God. Yeah, exactly. Because our shows is the way we've the, we you know we there was no point in doing billboards back in the day. We went to shows and people tasted and came back for more. And that's now unfortunately, and I touched on it earlier. Your husband, your late husband uh, Edward, he died in two thousand and five, and I have heard you talk about how you kept on going. But I think that you undersold yourself. You just said that you had a chat with yourself <laughs> and kept going because you had to. Yes, that's what I felt at the time. But it was, it that, was time, it that simple? Um, no, it wasn't that simple. Um, but it was, um, no, it wasn't that, it wasn't simple at all. Um, but I suppose, again, it was day to day. I didn't want to say, um, oh, this is my plan for the next five years or this is my plan for the next 10 years. You know, it was almost survival mode and it was day by day by day. And then, um, you know, I, I suppose talking to business people and different things, I realised that if you're not absolutely going forward in business, you're standing still is not an option because your competitors, everything is going ahead of you. So, um, and I suppose I was always background and because um, Edward was the, the 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 front man and the front person and the personality and all the rest, and I was very very glad to sit in a van and drive it or do whatever you know or go to a, a tasting or that. But um, business, I had never done business. I hadn't even studied business in school. I did the sciences, and um, you were going to be a brain technician. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. How far how far can you go uh, away from business and um, but um, yeah, so it was a case of um, 
bull by the horns, really, and just get on with it and get on with it. The business was there. It was going to be a crying shame to let it go. And um, it just took a bit of energy to keep it keep it going. You are, as I mentioned earlier, a, a mentor, sometimes mentor on the Going for Growth program. What mentorship do you give in the sense of what top tips do you give and what do you look out for to say, oh my God, that person's never going to make a business out of that? Um, I think, um, yes, that was uh, the Going for Growth programme was excellent. And when I see um, people that are very successful now and I'm saying, oh, I mentored her. and, and that and mentor- so satisfying. It is, and men- mentoring is um, seemingly, is, is I mean, it's, it's a very serious business, but I could, do nothing I'll be myself and but I I, I suppose I, I could um, advise uh, advise on um, I, I won't say uh, matters of the heart you know of what it was to to be passionate and to follow your heart and and my biggest strength would be people and surrounding yourself with people who are who can do the things you can't do and the most important thing is to let them at it you know, I don't micromanage anybody because they're able to do the accounts and the sales and the production and the, the, the market. They're able to do all the things that I can't. I can do a bit of everything, but they are excelling in their departments. And then you just let them, let them do, let them excel. And what would you tell people not to do? Not to be afraid. Not that's, to a, be, that's a hard one, though, isn't it? Like it anybody is, in business, it is, it is. Everything depends on it. You know, you're going to. Maybe borrow money. You've got staff maybe depending on you. You've got maybe kids at home. You know, does, it's yes, just not easy. Yeah, 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 no, it's not easy. It's not a, communication. Communication, I suppose, is um, and shared problems. You know, again, talk to people, listen to people, listen to people, you know. And then don't do, take their advice. <laughs> you could maybe, will, maybe it's just what you wanted to hear. And more often than not, it's, it's not. But it's, it's telling you what not to do. You know, so, you know, there is something, there is something to be gained, something, I won't say something positive, but there is something to be gained from every conversation and whether it'll be something you'll go with or go the other direction is important. You know, the last question we ask everybody on the podcast is who would you, Colette Toomey, hire in a heartbeat? And I was saying, who would I hire in a heartbeat? And I was saying, no, I would have to get to know somebody. I'd have to see person's strengths and have to see person. But um, and so just but, on that, when you yeah. are measuring them, what are you looking at? And you know, do you sit them in a room and do you have a cup of tea, or do you put them through a formal exam type thing? Attitude, attitude. Mm. Hire for attitude and train for aptitude. You know, because a person, if they have the right attitude, you can train them to do something. If they have the wrong attitude. All the training in the world is not going to work. Um, and I was thinking of that now on my long trip up from West Cork. And I said, who? And then there's there's one lady now that I very much admire in the um, entrepreneurial and uh, Nora Casey. You know, and Nora? Her, and I have met with her and she's a lovely, lovely but, but lady. Oh, to have her energy and yeah. her, um, you know, if... Um, it, yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't bottle it. And her, um, yes, it, she, she, she's one now that I would, um, Paula Fitzsimon from Going for Growth. She's you know, a she's huge leads, pal of ours on this show. Yeah, yeah. she leads um, so many, um, so many mentors who mentor um, the women's also program, the women, the yeah, women's yeah. program. Yeah. Um, it is, successful. it is, yeah. it is um, unreal. And I mean, a lot of women um, organizations, but not because. It's because they're a business. And, um, you know, as entrepreneurs in 2010, Ernest and Young told me that I was an entrepreneur. So I said, really? <laughs> I didn't know that. But that has been a program that has been, um, there's guidance, there's um, mentorship, there's there's um, everything you could um, wish for in people, like-minded people. And it's, um, so there are programs for people that, um, that the help is out there. There absolutely is. Did you just actually, uh, since you mentioned it, what exactly did you get out of that EY Entrepreneur of the Year program? What um, for for yourself? Now? I I I I think I got global vision. 
That's, you know, because... God, that's fantastic, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, you're in my score, you're... Because everybody, oh, Clannacil, do you even know Clannacil, Jane? And, and uh, somebody in Shanghai said to me, uh, so you're here, so does that mean it's going to... Be, pudding is going to be here, you know? And um, and I thought about it and I said, yeah, why not? And, you know, I suppose the centre of the... It, it gave me a sense of, um, dare I say, pride um, in, in the actual... Um, success and the ability of the company and the value that people have on the products. And why wouldn't you not? I mean, you have built a fantastic but, business but and Toomey is on the label. But you think, you still think of it as um, it's it's just a grown version. And you, of course, like we're still a small business. We're, in a, we're a big business, but we're still small family thinking business. So that's you know it's 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 the Toomey family, it's the Clonakilty family, it's the town of Clonakilty family, and all the same feel across the whole lot. And what I learned about you is you're a blow-in. You're from Manan Bridge, and nowhere Bridge. near. Yeah, well, it's about 30, 30 miles. Uh, ah, yeah, but 30, you're not... 30, yeah, miles, fifty kilometers. Um, yes, but in the global sense, that's just the next parish. <laughs> It is a tremendous story. It's my huge pleasure, Colette Toomey, to have you on. And I would ask you, please come back again any time at all, because I just enjoy chatting to you. So, Colette Toomey, boss of Clannacilty Foods, as we'll call you. That is, yes, that's, thank that's you so much for joining us. Thank you. You're listening to That Great Business Show. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. So, right, here's the deal. I'll cut your lighting bill by 80% if you give me 40% of the money saved. Oh, and uh, you don't have to pay any upfront costs. That's the basics of a business known as Light as a Service, a business that was pioneered by a company founded in 2015 that is called Urban Volt. Since then, the business has moved on and is moving more and more into the solar energy business. And the good news for Urban Volt and others in that sector is that just yesterday, the EU announced plans to jumpstart, as they say, a large-scale rollout of solar energy across Europe and rebuild Europe's solar manufacturing industry. The plan is part of its bid to wean countries off Russian fossil fuels. And solar costs have plunged by more than 80% over the last decade, but the technology produced only 5% of EU electricity in 2020. So, Urban Volt CEO Kevin Mon may be the right man in the right place right now. And luckily for me, he's also the man sitting right in front of me. Kevin Mon, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you very much, Connell. It's great to be here. Your time has come. Our time, my timing could not have been better. I knew you were coming in, but I didn't know the EU was going to announce this about solar energy. Well, we had a little word with them before. Just before, <laughs> when we knew we were coming on bo- on uh, online here for the show, we decided we'd better get them. This is a stuff. game changer. It's it's finally, it's that statement of its time has come for solar is is so accurate. It's It's been for years on the fringes, in, and particularly in the Irish market, wind energy as, as a renewable source was was an obvious choice uh, and, a, and a, probably a good investment over, over the years. But solar now, definitely the time has come. There's so little of, uh, of Europe and particularly Ireland, less than 3% of Ireland's energy is generated by solar. And, and with the recent advances in technology over the last decade in solar, you no longer need you know bright sunlight. So you don't have to be in the middle of the desert to do this. Uh, you just need daylight. So... And we have plenty of that. We do have plenty of daylight. Surprisingly, we, we have much more daylight than people realise. We uh, we do very well in the summer months. We get about, on average, I think about a thousand hours in, uh, of peak 
energy production plus then other hours of non-peak, which is which is quite quite substantial. A thousand, that's a year, I hope. A year. Yeah. Yeah. Not in a day. No, not in a day. Not, although <laughs> some of my days feel like that. <laughs> so you, you're effectively moving away from the core business or the, the, the former core business. Would I be right? Well, we're not moving away. It's a, it's a branching into another option for, for clients. When we started out in business as lighting as a service, it was very well received. It was novel at the, at the time. There was a huge uh, efficiency saving to install LED lighting. Uh, and we'd share the, the, I suppose, those savings with the clients. Uh, we always intended to add other technologies. Uh, and, and as you said, that which ones arrive at the right time. So, so battery storage is not quite there. Uh, I, I do envision, and we can talk about it later, kind of a, a battery first future for the world. Um, but but solar energy is there now. It's ready to be done. The price has come down on the panels uh, and and some of the infrastructure surrounding that. And so it's now makes it sense to do it. So so we will offer solar uh, installations to large uh, corporates or, or uh, industrial buildings, typically warehouses or factories. Uh, we'll put the array up for nothing, and then we share the we will provide the energy for the customer underneath. And uh, they just pay a simple pr- price per kilowatt hour. So they can buy solar energy just like they buy energy from the grid. And it's typically about a third less than the price they pay on the uh, pay the grid for utility-based energy. So talk me through a case study. I am Acme Limited. And yeah. what's your ideal size business that you need to make sense for you? I think it works for... The beauty of solar is that it works for so many businesses. Other, a lot of other technologies, you need you need huge scale. If you're a smaller size building, and by smaller in, in the industrial size is maybe 10,000 square feet. Uh, we've done much smaller than that, but we've also done you know enormous buildings, which are you know hundreds of thousands of square feet. But it makes sense for, for pretty much everyone because the, the scale of the solar array... If it's a smaller building, your your needs underneath that building are lower. What what is what's more, I suppose, a bigger driver is how much energy can you take. So a warehouse doesn't have a huge energy consumption. It's the lighting, and and all of our customers would have had LED lighting, which would cut that. It's computers, charging electric forklifts, things like that. It's not a huge energy consumption. So for a warehouse, you typically don't need to cover the entire building. It's maybe only a third of the the. A uh, building's roof would be covered in panels, but that would produce probably fifty percent of the energy that they would consume underneath, and in some cases more. Whereas Which is a chunk. It's a it's a good chunk, uh, and as as uh, I suppose feed in tariffs come in, or if they come in, it's a big question. Which now you talk in the language of your business, yes. and because I was um, sp- spilling or something, spilling like that. yeah, spilling energy I was into the grid. This stuff and I was saying, oh, God, and I don't understand any of this. Yes. So again. Yeah. What is possible at the moment and what is, because I know there's some funny business going on here, so I've heard. So let's just stick to the straight business for a second. Yeah. So Acme Limited, you go up onto my roof. Now, you physically are not, you're not up there with your screwdriver. No, not because me I want to get onto the, the, that side of your business. But up it goes and it feeds in and... We feed directly what they call, our installations are behind the meter. So the energy that is produced on your roof, you will use inside your building behind your meter. So you will use that energy first before you will draw energy in from the grid. And that's so there's a, that's what a behind the meter means, is that it's it's your own private installation. You're consuming the energy. You're not reaching out to the into the grid or spilling excess energy back through the meter into the grid. Is that the industry term? It is spilling it. Yeah. Well, that's it seems to be the generic term. It's the term you use anyway. Yeah, so I was reading yeah. about you. Well, <laughs> it seems, I think people, it seems it's a term that people understand uh, well. It's like, look, I have excess energy. What do I do with it? I spill it into the grid. And okay. people, it's, it's a term I think because people in the industry use. Uh, feeding but it into the grid is they the... They don't use it a lot in Ireland. Why? I don't, they don't, well, there's a lots of reasons. Come on, I mean, I, you're here for a reason. I want you to start giving out. No. There's, something, <laughs> there's something going on that well, shouldn't I, be going on. I would think, uh, look, look, I think the large utility companies, it's not in their best interests for people to be suddenly generating their own power locally on site. I, mean, I don't think anyone needs to be a rocket science, a scientist to figure that out. Uh, the people, I suppose the people who, who are in charge of the grid... Uh, are also 
you know, a part of a government owned entity, which is owned by, I suppose, the, the citizens of Ireland, but they are also the, uh, you can't quite say monopoly provider of power to people, but they control 50 plus percent of, uh, of all of the consumption in the country. They also happen to, to control the grid through a, another company, in fairness. So I think you see it in other countries. If you look in, at America, Germany, where solar energy was was far more advanced in terms of installations on both residential and on commercial, the, there was a certainly a, a stalling of the rolling out of that uh, by the people who would operate, I suppose, the grid. They don't. They, they may say something different, and then politicians may say something different, but but it's not in their best interest. They generate power and they sell it to customers. Why would you want your customer to, you know, start baking their own bread uh, and eating it at home at, you know, a, le- a lesser price than buying, uh, you know, your batch loaf off the, the shelf? There's a very good reason, and one of the, one of those reasons is spelt Russia, is we've got to start producing our own energy. We uh, look, we are, I suppose, an island economy off the coast of of Europe. If it wasn't for U.S. foreign investment, we probably no one would have heard of us. Uh, we don't generate any of our own power really in a meaningful way. If we don't start becoming self sufficient, and I I think it's going to get worse than people realize. I think we will have rolling brownouts in the future. I think because we're at the edge of the market, who's going to get affected first? The small, tiny economy that doesn't really have much sway in the world. I saw yesterday, I think, some a report saying we're okay because we got our gas from Britain. I'm thinking uh, when, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I had David Horgan on uh, his petrol resources. I had him on the podcast. It's well worth listening to him because mm. he ha- he is the oil and gas business, and he knows what he's talking about. And he also said we will have brownouts or blackouts or call them whatever else is, but we will not have power. I, and I think that's one of the attractive qualities of the offer we're making, to, to particularly to manufacturing companies who consume huge amounts of power. And, and we can envision a future, and I don't mean a, in the long term, I, not you know, next year, where it could be, sorry, Mr. Manufacturer of Widget X, you're not going to be able to produce on, on uh, Thursday. You can't have power on Thursday. I can see that becoming a reality for a for a three or four year period in, in this market. But that is already the scene with data centers, is it not? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know the inner workings of data centers. Nobody seems to know the inner workings of data centers and how much energy they, energy they actually consume. Um, but I think they, they they will be high on the list of... But you can't well, turn the, off the power uh, to a data center, though, is the problem. But they won't give it. power to the data center, so we're not going to have any more of those. And that's a story in itself. Well, that's I think you could, you could talk for several hours on, uh, on the data center. Uh, story in the Irish market. It, it has been a huge boom for the Irish market data centres. Uh, it's a reason for, it's a draw for lots of foreign direct investment. I don't think, I think it's possible for us to power data centres. Um, we just need to think of it in a different way. And it, this idea of, okay, there's a 10 acre field there and we're going to build something in it. You don't, you need a 10 acre field plus a thousand acres around it of a solar farm or wind to, to help offset that energy and make that investment in that at the same time. And thank you very much for introducing that item because <laughs> your farms, the solar farms, they're also now being objected to by people. Well, it's the interesting thing, these solar farms that... You know, we're not in the development business, so we don't go around and uh, haggle with farmers and lease land and then go and get planning permission and then try and sell them off. I'm not in that business. So, But you, there is a certain amount of you have to bid for uh, to be able to sell your power into the grid at a wholesale rate. Uh, it has seemed like that Res 1, which they call the Renewable Energy Scheme 1, uh, a lot of those bids that went in were so low that they were unable to build the solar farms and feed the, the the energy in at that agreed rate to the grid, it would have been unprofitable. So a lot of those have not come on stream. Now, there, I don't know why the price was so low that people bid. I mean, I've, I've heard reasons. Go on. Um, no, I, I think you know the business. I, I think I think there might have been some bidders were bidding so low that they they were uh, driving them down to, to driving everyone's price down to make it unaffordable to do it so that. The less of them would get built. Uh, this is the making of a movie, you know. There's uh, dirty work everywhere. Well, I, I, you know, it's it's when a technology comes on stream, and it, it was wasn't vi- it wasn't that viable in the Irish market ten years ago, maybe fifteen years ago. Now it is it is a hugely viable 
uh, way of producing renewable on-site energy. Um, you know, for most of our solar uh, customers, they would probably be generating about 35% of their energy from their own roof. Now, that's a significant portion of their energy. And, and from an energy security point of view, for a day that you can't get power from the grid potentially in the future, to be able to use your own energy from your own roof during that period, that's a that's a you know that's a, a real protection uh, for for a company, and I think that's some of the reasons some of the bigger companies are, are are doing this with us. So back to my case study. Yes. So I say I want to have solar energy. I ring up Urban Volt, and you come along. I don't have to put my hand in my hot pocket, do I? No, what we do is, uh, we call it solar as a service. You know, I'm, we love the marketing slang uh, at Urban Vault, but I make it simple. But it's it's this idea, it's called a, a, a commercial PPA, a power purchase agreement. So we'll build the solar array for you. You give us your roof, we'll put something on it, a solar array on it, uh, and you agree to purchase the power off, the, off your roof at a reduced price per kilowatt hour. Um, and that's, it's something that had been happening for, you know, probably it's not new, it's been going, it happening in the last 10 or 12 years with large, you know, Intel would probably purchase their power solar uh, investment this way, as opposed to using your own cash to buy, to put up the solar panels, you just agree to a fixed pr pr price to per kilowatt hour. And then it's, it's up to us to maintain it. Uh, we're in, I suppose it's a, a true partnership. My job is to generate as much power as I can because I don't get paid unless we're generating power. So I keep the canals clean and make sure that all of the uh, electrical components are operational and uh, and the customer is getting as much as they can get from their own roof. So it's I think it's a good fit. And, you know, we're working on probably close to, well, I'm a little north of 500 projects now in the Irish market. Not that wow. we've not installing that we're working on with customers and yeah. working through the, you don't do the, the options. Oh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd say we will probably install at least 100 of those though. But well, do you not subcontract sub that out? Yes, we yeah. with the in middle the piece in the middle we would subcontract out. So we don't make panels, and we don't you know we we will buy in the panels. We only use, I suppose, if in more industry lingo, tier one panels. But of course, and that's well, it's important. I don't need go tier one myself. Yeah, well, exactly. It's well, it's important to when people are looking at well, will I buy them? Will I not? You hear people saying, oh, I can get a very short payback, four or five years, if I put solar panels in, but. Solar panels are a lot like everything else. There's varying types. And uh, and your typical install is a 19.3 year install. Yes, it? it's funny. We started with uh, offering everyone, we thought, well, let's do shorter term to make it, a, you know, easy for people. So a 10 year agreement. But then once people actually understand the model and they go, wait, but if I'm able to lock in a price today and you're saying I can lock in for as much as 30 years, why would I lock in? For 10, I want to lock it in for 20 or 30. And we find is the average client is locking in for about 20 years. And we'll, get, we'll agree that rate today and it won't change for 20 years. And that is the business model, which is actually quite simple in a way. You're a bank or you are a funder. We are, we are, we look at our business in different ways. There's there's three businesses. There's a sales and marketing business at the front end. We try and make these complicated structures easy for people to understand uh, and easy for them to sign up to. So it's a one-page agreement. It's not 95 pages of legalese. Um, then the middle part of our business in the center is the logistics and the sourcing, the shipping, the installing of, uh, and it's the same for the lighting business, of the technical uh, product. And then the back end and the maintenance. And then on the third part of our business is, yes, we are a finance company on the back end, uh, constantly trying to create novel ways of sourcing capital at a cheap rate to uh, fund these deals. And that is that is the business. It is three businesses in one. And maybe, and I'm hopeful for you, that there will be European money. Because they look, they, this is this <clears throat> the big idea to take on Putin. But you never know, you might be getting some very nice Offers of finance. Well, listen, that would be very nice if we get some of that sweet, sweet European <laughs> Union uh, money at low rates. Well, it's, it's to be uh, announced next week. I think it's, but it's it's meaningful. I think they're making taking a, a real, very real step towards energy independence. I mean, piping all our gas from into Europe from Russia, you know, was never, I don't think, a great idea. It was the cheapest option. Yeah. Um, but that's as with everything else in life is never the best idea. So we, I think, we need to make this investment and and look at it as a ten to twenty year investment for, from across the EU to. There's no reason we can't be generating. 
10x the amount of power we power we, we generate with solar now in in five years from now. But that would mean that you would have a huge pipeline of work, which in turn means that you need funding. Listen, this is a business because we install things at no cost to the customer. We bear all of the capital expense and all of the capital risk. Yes, we're, we are, and we we sort of we get our return over multi years. We wait for it, but it's a long term business with long term relationships with clients. So there's a there's a value that's created as well. So I'm not complaining about my about my but business. Pension but pension funds must love you. Do you do they fund you or I, indirectly through through. Uh, through debt funds, they would fund us. Um, yes, I think pension funds, solar is great for pension funds and the type of the type of business like Urban Vault and, and there will others will emerge, I'm sure. Um, it's a great business for them because it's a diversified client base. You're not taking huge risk on one, say, uh, utility scale solar farm, which is, you know, 95% not, not chance nothing's going to happen. But there's always that small risk. Whereas with a diversified portfolio of you know, commercial businesses that you can credit rate, uh, you suddenly create a, a diversified income stream for a pension fund that's going to last. Our solar panels are warranted for 25 years. They have a useful life of 40 years. So you have a long-term predictable output of energy and you have a, the beauty of our business is we have a guaranteed offtaker of the energy right underneath where the panels are. So we're like a we're like a distributed utility company. So we're a, a virtual power plant, but we're spread out across you know, hundreds of roofs right now, but it will become tens of thousands of roofs, hopefully. But if you raise 100 million, if you raise uh, 400 million, you'd do four times the business as quickly, would you? Yeah. Or is there a constraint? Is there a bottleneck yeah. on the actual panels? There's a bo- I'd say there's a, there, well, there has been a bottleneck on the panels. The last year, it was quite, the prices did uh, drive up on the panels. And this year, they've risen. And that's because China has, has jumped so much. They're eating so much of their own production. They have, I think they installed... Last year, I could be wrong in these numbers, but I think they installed the equivalent in China, in just in China alone, in one year, the equivalent of all solar installed around the rest of the world for the last 10 years. They have decided to embrace it in a big, big way. And it's, I think it's because the technology has come to a point where you're getting a very, you're getting a great yield now out of a, out of a panel. It's a good investment and it's, it's long term. It's boring. They don't need a lot of maintenance. You do have to maintain them. Um, you have to wash them down. Is that right? But you know what? That's one of the. That's one of the big things. You have to get up on the roof and wash them down. We have we have one client who's in the cement making business uh, and wants to offset as much of their carbon as they can, and and they're they're doing it for the right reasons. But the production on their I facility, hope it's EcoSAM because I had Susan uh, of EcoSAM on the podcast about three two or three weeks ago, maybe four weeks. Well, ago. I can't I can't speak about individual clients, but I can <laughs> I, I can say that their 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 production of electricity the yield out of those panels if they're not kept clean is about 40 percent less because there's so much dust in the air yeah, that settles on the panels so so each environment has a different uh, a different issue but yeah keeping them clean is the critical thing then you got to make sure that there's no strings of them are, are are not operating at peak if one panel goes out it could take out you know, if the electrical wiring on one, it could take out a whole string of panels. So we have a dashboard where we can monitor all of the installations and we can see, and there's alerts, if, if production is down, is slightly down, we know, we'll know where it is on the on the layout of where there's a problem and then we can go straight to it and fix it. So, so the you obviously keep a very, very close eye, I'm sure, on technology. How efficient can they become? We, we, you know, will you, I don't know what they're at at the moment, but is there another I, I, I big leap due? N- no. Uh, that's uh, people. Some people will say yes. Uh, 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 we're kind of at the commercial coal face. Y- yes, there will be slight increases. Uh, you might get ten percent more, twenty percent more. Is I would think was a peak for this technology now. B- but there will be maybe in ten years' time other technologies. You need some other type of substance to make the panel out of that will be able to absorb more power and convert more of it into into output energy. So I think panels are pretty close to the where they're at. There might be another, as I said, 10 to 20% increase in output. But where they are now is like a panel, our panels typically would, would output around f- between four and 500 watts at, you know, on a peak day uh, per panel. So I, maybe 10 years ago, that would have been about 100 watts. So we've had a huge increase in, in output. So when you say 100 watts, is that just enough to run the old-fashioned la- light? You remember the yes, yeah, the old, uh, the old the hundred yeah. watt bulb, yeah, exactly. So one panel would the old panels, yeah. ours would run five of those bulbs uh, in in a given hour. 
And the big challenge now is the batteries. Well, are, I you, think, are you going to get into batteries? Yes, uh, an unequivocal yes, because the future I see for for business, and maybe it's the same for residential. We haven't we, we've looked at the market, but it's not something we're we're looking at deeply right now. But in the commercial side. I believe in a kind of a battery first strategy. So I think all businesses will have a battery. Now I'm not we're not providing them today, but you will then look at your you will draw all of your power from your battery. And then you look at how do I how do I fill this battery? And locally sourced on-site renewable energy will be the cheapest form and that will be your first source of fuel for your battery. Off-peak energy uh, in markets that offer it at a cheaper rate, will that will be your second source of energy. And peak energy will be your lender of last resort. You won't want to be taking that. You'll do anything not to take it. Uh, because the pricing on that, imagine if you're taking two-thirds of your energy from other sources and the existing utilities are only providing one-third of your energy, they're not going to price it where it is today. It's going to be priced at probably 3x where it is today because they're being asked to keep power plants running with, when they're not having full production, God, it's a very interesting. That's so my view is everywhere. Aren't well, there? my view is the, is is the opposite of I think the popular view in in the media is that oh, more renewables will make everything cheaper, uh, for electricity cheaper. Yes, for the people who have renewables, their own and own their own output or have long term power, power purchase agreements, but not for somebody who's just attached to the grid and taking all of their energy from the utility company because. That, that energy will be so expensive. It, the average price of energy will come down, but peak energy from the utility provider will be at a crazy price, I think, in five to 10 years from now. So renewables will drive costs down overall, but I don't think people are digging deep enough into the story. That doesn't mean you'll be buying it cheaper from when you plug, you know, when you take it off the grid. It will be, I think, substantially more expensive off the grid. And we are a business show, so I'm not going to go down to the residential one, but I have to ask, because everybody's <laughs> listening, saying... Everybody asks. Uh, yeah, don't they? Yeah, because it's, it's, it's... When will it happen for residential? I, you know what? I think there's a. it's a fragmented market, the residential market. It's a difficult one to crack. Um, but houses different sizes. The economics of it are difficult. Uh, be honest, no one wants, you know, somebody calling up, giving you, you know, one one commercial customer for us is the same as having, say, 500 homes. But it's not it. You know, it's and just it's, easier. You know yeah. what? And it's the customer service side, you know, there's always problems in every business. There's always nothing is perfect. So you start looking at the scale of the customer service side you have to build and that cost you have to build that into the long-term costs of each installation. And I think a lot of people are scared of it. So to, a lot of people who want to do it at scale are scared of it. So it's something I would I would really like to crack that knot at some point. But it's happening soon. To, no, today's not it. It's fragmented. There's lots of guys out there. You know, I think reputable guys who, who will put solar on people's houses. The, the problem is, like our, our uh, finance director bought a house in Kildare a few years ago. He wanted to put solar on the roof. He got three uh, bids, three quite prices. And the price, the highest price was twice what the lowest price was. And none of them could explain a difference. And it was, they weren't great at, each offer was very confusing. And I think that's the problem in the market. It's confusing for, for end users or residential users. What exactly am I going to get from this? Like how much energy are you going to provide me? And you're looking for 10 grand or 20 grand or five grand, whatever the number is. But like they're talking payback years and they give you all these graphs and you know, spreadsheets, but the average consumer doesn't want to go through a spreadsheet and doesn't understand, you know, how big is a kilowatt? You know, how much, how much is 11 kilowatts? Can I fit that in the boot of my car or do I need a van or does that fill a whole warehouse? You know, I think the, the points of reference for consumers, they don't understand it. And so therefore it's confusing. And so it's difficult to make the decision. So you have to, you today, I think it's less of an economic decision for, for most people. I think it's more of a decision about wanting to do the right thing today. And there's some economics to it, but, but there is, if you combine it with a battery installation, there is an economic benefit to putting solar on your roof of your house and putting a battery inside your house. And for our business listeners, which is the main, uh, yeah. the, the main listenership, how small can somebody be and still make sense and do the right thing for their business? I think you'd need. I'm trying to think of the size. The size because we think in we think in sort of megawatts or kilowatts nameplate size installations, and I'm trying to convert that to roof size in my head. I think you'd need to be around. If you had a five thousand square foot 
I don't know, warehouse or you know, a small manufacturing yeah. place or an office building. I, th- I think that it makes sense at that. Uh, it, below that, you know, it probably still makes sense, but we're not your guy for that. Um, I think some. I think you're better off buying it if you're if it's smaller than that. And our chat so far suggests that you are only in Ireland, but you're not. No, we're, we're not only in Ireland. In the lighting business, we're in about nine, nine ten countries. Um, it was kind of sneaky the way that you managed to do that. Like, where did that come from? One of them is down, which I was kind of my head went, what is is um, New Zealand. Yeah, well, that was funnily enough when we first started looking at can we sell this remotely. Um, we had a, a customer call, a potential customer prospect called us up from New Zealand and said, look, I, I was traveling. I met a guy that you did an installation for in, I think it was Germany or Holland that we were doing business with. He said, look, you should use these guys, call them. And uh, and we just decided, well, look, if we can if we can close it without having to go to New Zealand, close the deal, uh, and we can find a reputable installation partner and service partner in the area, which we, we didn't have, which we found, then let's take it and and see how it goes, and uh, and that went that went fantastically well. And then we we ended up doing a second and a third for that client, but we don't market or sell in New Zealand. If somebody calls us up, we will go. We can we can have it done no problem. We can price it with software now. We don't need to visit the site. We don't need to see it. So we can we can give a pretty accurate price without having to be there. So so uh, where are your big markets? I suppose the big market for the lighting, well, the, for solar as a service, it's the Irish market right now. And uh, some in the UK, we are pricing projects for, for existing customers on the lighting side. We're pricing solar projects in Holland, Germany, Belgium, France, um, I think Austria and the UK. So, And, and those would be our bigger markets. Uh, Austria, not so much, but, but Germany, Holland, Belgium and... Uh, and the UK would be our bigger markets. We're also in the US. Uh, but during COVID, we made the decision to kind of pull back on our set of sales and marketing in the US. It was, I don't know, it, it was, it would have been a waste of a waste of money. It's quite a, it's a big job marketing and selling in the in the US. Yes, indeed. Yes. It's, so we decided let's let's pull back during COVID and just you know stick Actually, to our knitting. And just to go off down the little rabbit holes that I love going down, I saw a a, a map online. The other day, Texas. How do you, how big do you think Texas is relative to Europe? Oh, you know what? I probably should know this. I I I think it is the same size. I think it's probably two thirds the size of Europe. Probably it's more or less the same size as continent. You know what we would call yeah, continental, continental Europe. Europe, yeah, Western Europe. And then you'd kind of say, oh, "Wow, well, it's a they are the market is enormous, mm. and and it's it's a different market, and they think differently." Um, uh, and it's 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 very highly evolved in in a lot of ways. Uh, in other ways, maybe not so much. But in 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 some ways, it's a very high, highly evolved commercial market. So, what's the future for you? I've been chatting to you for quite some years now, and uh, following the progress. And uh, every time I meet with you, things have changed. Have changed fundamentally. Well, we we I suppose the business this business is on a it's a journey. It's just like we take the customers on a on a journey. It's a transition. Um, when we started. We wanted to make a difference. We wanted to use the power of business to, I suppose, to do good. You know, we also want to make money and we want to get a return for our shareholders and all those other things that businesses do. But we thought you should be able to use a business to engender good as well. And so we thought this in, in industry is a good place to do that. Uh, so far, the lighting is, was, a, was a, a, a great business and is a great business. It slowed during COVID, which allowed us to then focus on solar. Uh, so we were on the top of the roof instead of the underneath of the roof because we couldn't get into the buildings to install the product. And now that business is taking back off again as, as the world is opening up and people are manufacturing again and allowing you into the buildings. That's great. Um, it's The next step will be battery storage, we think, will probably be the next technology. Uh, and as efficiency, as the efficiency side of the industry is, is driving forward, people are now very much excited about the renewable side. And uh, for some reason, solar in particular seems to be a sexy kind of uh, sell. It gets more attention when you talk to customers. They're far more interested in generating en- you know, a clean energy on their own site than saying, but look, a better investment is to reduce your consumption. It's probably a 3x better return for you. I know, but 
I really want to, I want to generate my own energy. There's some, I don't know, uh, there's something in the psyche about that. I don't know. And I still I haven't gotten to the I presume the sun warmed us since the day one. So we kind of, it's, yeah. it's, it's literally in our DNA. Well, we find it, uh, it's, people get far more excited. And now it's not, it's a better return to use less energy because you don't have to make any more. Uh, but people love the idea of generating their own energy, and particularly on their own roof. There's something, there's something good, and it does. It's a great idea. You, everyone should be doing it. It's a, it makes no sense not to. It's a roof is sitting there doing nothing except keeping you dry right now. That's it. It's a dead asset for most businesses. So they may as well turn it into something that's generating something for them. Super. Listen, last question. I ask everybody on the podcast, who would Kevin hire in a heartbeat? <sighs> God, um, you did get the email. I got the email, but you know what? I went through <laughs> a lot of people say, "Oh uh, no." Yeah, do you know what? There's there's somebody that I do business with, um, and he's one of, actually one of the funders of the business through a through a debt fund, and his name is Shane Lanigan, and uh, Beach Point Capital. And I think that he is exceptional at what he does. Um, I would hire him in the morning. He is concise. He cuts through all the. BS. I don't know what I can say on the on this. You can say anything you want. Well, he cuts this through is the, a podcast. Yes, that's true. He cuts through the bullshit. He's uh, he's very commercial. I mean, he's not. You know, he doesn't go down rabbit holes of meaningless information. Um, he's quick. He's clean. He gives good advice. Uh, he knows who his customers are and who they're not. He doesn't waste time. So he's not a busy fool. He's uh, I, I'm someone who I'm fond of, and I think he's he's uh, he's an exceptional at what he does. So I know that he would be in addition to our business. The or any he, business. And the fact that he funds you, that's a good one as well. Yeah. Well, no, I, you know what? We, we, there's a lot of people funding us. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's just, I was talking to him this morning and he, it struck me again that every time I speak with him, I go, geez, the guy knows what he's doing. I like people like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, there's yeah. no no gray areas. Yeah. It's just clean, simple. You may not love it all the time, but it's, you know, they're good at what they do. It's not what you want to hear. It's what you need to hear. Exactly. Now. Exactly. Kevin Mon of Urban Vault, thank you so much for joining us on That Great mm -hmm. Business Show. Thank you very much, Connell. And that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 87. Do please share this podcast with all of your connections on social media and do it now, please, before you forget. That can happen, you know. I think of a button for you, commercial success for us. And make it easy on yourselves to enjoy your favorite business podcast by simply pressing the subscribe button again. Just do it now. And if you want to get in touch, you can always talk to us directly on our LinkedIn page. Great brands like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland, ISME, Virgin Media, Udros, Nogaitachta, all advertise with us. Your business should do likewise. And I've just seen Kevin pick up his little box there. Kevin has a big beard. But Kevin, <laughs> what is your favorite shaving oil? My favorite shaving oil is de facto. That's amazing. I, it, it's a coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> and I'd say you shave a lot. I, I, an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> Big beardy on them. So why would be like the world's best sounding? We like being the best sounding business podcast. And that's why we work with our great friends here at the Dublin Podcast Studios including today's master of sound, Mark McCarthy. Later on, Peter Rice will add in the, those lovely stings that I love so much. The Dublin Podcast Studios are open for business, and if you want to record a podcast, check their new website and then have a chat with Peter Rice. If you want the media group, that's us, to produce your podcast, well then, talk to me, please. As always, the great business insights you hear on That Great Business Show are only made possible thanks to Kevin Mon's favourite shaving oil, maker. They also happen to be our sponsor, the great makers of the world's best shaving oil, de facto made in Mayo, sold worldwide. And finally, don't forget to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have our regular column all 